Has Chinese food over the years just gotten too spicy? And possibly, according to new statistics, it shows that the Sichuan food trend may have peaked. Yeah, for a second, I thought uh, 97 out of 100 dishes is going to be mala, but, uh, you know, it looks like it's possibly reversing. Uh, we got to talk about it, Andrew, because a new study came out from this website, Sixth Tone, and uh, they translate a lot of stuff in Chinese into English. Long story short, Andrew, they're asking the question, has China reached peak spice? Because Sichuan food, Andrew, over the past 10 years, in China, as well as Chinese diaspora communities became so dominant, it, it looked like it was just going too far. It looks like Cantonese food is coming back. Yeah, I would say in the past seven years, I mean, every new restaurant that opened up in New York City that was Chinese, like at least half of them, if not more, were Sichuan inspired. You know what I mean? And everybody has to have Sichuan dishes on their menu now, at least a few just to cater to that taste palette. But it may have peaked because now the amount of restaurants that are opening that are Sichuan are going down. So we're going to talk about it. Please hit that like button. Check out other episodes of the Hot Pot Boys. But you know what? If you don't want to go to a Sichuan restaurant, but you want to slightly Sichuan influence whatever you are eating, you should check out Smala. Yeah, Smala is actually really good. And by the way, guys, uh, a lot of non-Sichuan food eaters really like the sauce. Anyways, check it out, SmalaSauce.com. Yeah, I mean, listen... Sichuan is a hot seller still. It's not really that it's like reversing into the sense of like Sichuan food is not popular. It's just that the upward trend is more going slightly downward. Right. Because I mean, at one point it literally looked like what <clears throat> every single f food dish in China and the Chinese dis diaspora communities was going to become Sichuan. Yeah, I mean, looking at the charts, so between the two most popular singular cuisines, Sichuan food versus Guangdong cuisine, which is essentially Cantonese food, uh, are still the two biggest, most popular singular cuisines in China. All right. Of Chinese is, food. Is that chart shocking, though? That literally it goes like 28 and 20% and then 50% distribution for all other provinces? 28%. So that's almost one third of Chinese restaurants are considered Sichuan restaurants. That's a lot. You don't understand. That's a lot of restaurants because China... Has a lot of well, restaurants. Would that be like a third of restaurants in America being Texas barbecue yeah. or something like that? And I'm not going like to lie because like, David, Guangdong is like such a huge province. It's an entire huge, gigantic province that encompasses so many different cities. Uh, you know, so I mean like that, that is a, a huge cuisine. So yes, it just goes to speak on how popular Sichuan food is. It was getting too much, man. Listen, guys, I love Sichuan food. I go to Sichuan Mountain House all the time here in New York. It was just getting out of control, man. It was becoming overwhelming. Uh, you can look at this chart. The Sichuanese craze is cooling down. So then the chart shows that the Sichuan cuisine amount of restaurants is, is going down. Finally, Guangdong cuisine actually is kind of seeing a little bit of a rise, David. Are people coming back to Cantonese food? Yeah. And it shows that Cantonese food is really popular on the coastline. It even has a heat map referencing like Sichuan is popular in these regions. Guangdong, of course, mostly on the coastline because Guangdong, I, I feel like the flavors are going to appeal to people, Andrew, who also live on the coastline. Yeah. And I would say overall, I think people are coming back to Cantonese restaurants partially because just because you're labeled as a Cantonese restaurant, it doesn't mean you don't have any Sichuan dishes. I notice a lot of new Chinese restaurants that open up in New York City, for example, they might be mostly Shanghainese or Cantonese food, but they'll have some chili dishes. They always have a lot of ji. Yeah, they have a lot of ji. They have a, uh, or maybe a ko shui ji, which is a mouthwatering chicken. They'll have something with chili peppers. Yeah, so here are a quick examples of a few Sichuanese dishes. You have sui zhu yu, you have the sautéed eel and duck blood curd. I think that that one doesn't come over to America as much. Um, you've got, you know, uh, rosu over here. You got mapo tofu, and of course the la zi ji. Cantonese, you've got hakao. You've got Gong Tao Ao Ho, which is here. You've got the pineapple bun with the butter, roast goose, uh, a boat siphon over here. But it says that both Cantonese restaurants and Sichuan restaurants are becoming more expensive. Mm. Have you noticed that trend? There, there's a lot of high-end stuff nowadays. Whether yeah. it's, uh, we're talking about Mott 32s all the way to Ulas and Lunars. And that everything. is true that there are more cheaper Cantonese restaurants than there are Sichuan restaurants that are cheap, though. At least in America, for yeah, sure. And, that's true. And, and overseas, uh, you know, I don't know. It's tough to say in China. I mean, I guess for me, my quick takes are this. 
I was waiting for this to happen. And I don't know if it's because we're Cantonese, Andrew, but I always wanted to see more representation for other provinces of food, not just Sichuan. Mm. I'm not saying that Sichuan doesn't deserve it, but 33% of the restaurants in China being Sichuanese, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. What are some other cuisines that you feel like are underrated that should be more popular, David? All right, so in the article, it lists Guizhou food. Mm. Would you agree? Guizhou food is underrated, especially Guizhou Mi Fun. And it also lists a lot of stuff from Lanzo. You know, like uh, Dun Huang. Yeah, no, food. Lanzo La Mian. It's, uh, that's super popular. Right, right, right. It has a lot of uh, Muslim influence in there. I would say this. Dongbei as an entire region is underrated. Mm. That's my number one Dongbei food is hyper underrated. Mm. Uh, here's the weird thing, Andrew. A lot of American Chinese food, Andrew, is sort of based off Dongbei food. Sweet and sour pork is based mm. off Guobao Ro. I think that uh, sort of related to Dongbei food, I do think the Shandong food is underrated. Uh-huh. Huang okay. Wenji, De Zhou Ji. Um, Yunnan food is underrated, but probably not Guo Chao Mian. I think that in America, people only know Yunnan food for uh, crossing bridge noodles. I think Yunnan has a lot more to offer. Um, but yeah, I would say that every province in China has like some banger dishes, but certainly some provinces have way more than others. Right. Oh, here's another thing that a lot of people don't know about Sichuan food, Andrew. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Sichuan food was only 30% ma la. It was 70% non-spicy dishes. Right. They said over the past 30 years, due to the newer chefs and just that popular, I guess you want to say it like legally drug-inducing feeling that mala can give you. Now, when you look at a Sichuan menu, 70% of the, percent of the dishes are mala. Wow. 30% of the dishes are non-mala. Mm. So I, I just wanted to pop up some photos of the non-mala dishes just to prove to people, you know. Yeah, not, you mean not every Sichuan dish is mala. Yeah. Of course not. Yeah, of course they don't. But yeah, it seems like, especially with the colors and the spice and, you know, people when they pay for food, they feel like they want to get that experience and get a feeling from their food. Here's the thing. Cantonese food is always very delicious, but it may not give you that quite intoxicating experience that Sichuan yes. food, it literally, Sichuan food literally is intoxicating. Yeah, for Cantonese food, maybe you just eat it and then you feel very yummy. But then for Sichuan food, you eat it and then you feel like, ah. Yeah. Um, let's get into the comment section. Somebody said, probably it's hard to find a good Cantonese restaurant outside of Guangdong because the dishes are not very easy to cook. Sichuan food is actually not that easy to make. Basically, once you get access to the peppers. You mean it's not that difficult to make. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this other guy said, yes, it's true because Sichuan restaurants were designed to mask the ingredients in the Sichuan region mm -hmm. at a time in the ancient days, Sichuan, it, it's a lot of ba ba uh, basins and valleys. They couldn't get the good ingredients. Mm. So they threw the peppers on it to mask it. Right. So I guess, um, what do you think of that? Do you think that's true? Like, I guess I, I, I guess I could see that. I mean, usually when people spice their food a lot, it was usually partially out of necessity. Right. Because, Coastal regions are very, very yeah, seldom spicy. Seafood regions are never the spiciest because you have access to fresh seafood and you have a good ingredients. So you don't need to spice your food. Like any type of beachy food, like even California beachy food is not spicy. Right. Japanese food is super, super not spicy. Yeah, Japanese food is not spicy. Um, somebody said Cantonese food concentrates on the eastern coast because that's where they have enough fresh ingredients and that is required to make Cantonese food taste good. That is my guess. Mm. Yeah, I do think a lot of geography has to do with it. I do think nowadays it's different. Now you have Sichuan lobster dishes because they can get lobsters in inland right, right, due right. to uh, just transportation systems are just way more advanced nowadays. Someone said the reason why Sichuan food is so popular within China is because Sichuan people migrate everywhere to work in China, whereas Guangdong people tend to leave the country or go to Southeast Asia or move to the West. Oh, that's very interesting. I guess I could see that. Yeah. Somebody said you are more likely to find a good Cantonese restaurant in Oregon than you are to find one in Inner Mongolia. Basically, the Cantonese food is better in a coastal part of America than in an inland part of China. That's actually a see, that's that's interesting. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an like, interesting take. I guess I could see. There's yeah, some especially truth in Inner that. Mongolia, for sure. The Cantonese food is probably super not good in right, Inner right, right. Anyway, um, have you ever heard of Yunnan cuisine? Um, Andrew, Yunnan cuisine recently became more popular, right? The Yunnan cuisine is pretty good, man. And a lot of people call it like Chinese pho because actually there's a lot of Southeast Asian influence in Yunnan, right? Especially in the mountain ranges. Somebody said Jiangxi region uh, cuisine rise up. 
I had to look up photos of Jiangxi cuisine. I didn't even know what it was. It, it looks tasty, but I'll tell you this. There's no way Jiangxi region no, cuisine uh, okay. is taking over, man. Let it me defend. It doesn't got the look. I can defend every province of China because here's the thing. Every province in China, every province in China is going to have its like top five, top 10 dishes. Right. There are 10 dishes within every single Chinese province that are unique to that province that are really good. But does every province have 50 dishes that are really good? No. No, only essentially Guangdong is one of them has hundreds of dishes that are really good. Honestly, I hey, yo, man, I don't want to say this, but even Shanghai, once you get out of the top 20, you don't it's love not it. that yeah. good, man. Okay. Right, but the top 20 are really good from Shanghai. Right, but yeah, not every region yeah. has 50 to 100 good right, dishes. Right, 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 right. Listen, guys, it's all about That's why we Cantonese menus are so big. Think about it. Yeah, it's because even once you go down the bench, it's still fire. Right. Um, somebody said, uh, of course, there was just couples arguing in here. Somebody said, man, <clears throat> I hated this whole Ma La Sichuan cuisine craze over the past 10 years in, Ch in China, as well as Chinese diaspora communities. Somebody else said, oh, no, can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> I guess, what, what do you think about this debate, Andrew? I used to debate, uh, date a girl from Chengdu, and I would kind of like argue with her because I was like, I just can't stand going to Sichuan restaurants more okay. than once a week, man. Right. It's too oily. Right, I couldn't right. do it. It can get spicy and oily. Like when you get hot pot and you want the mala hot pot, you talking about I, Dalong, I just right? cannot get the spiciest level. I would never get the spiciest level because at some point it's just taking over the taste of the dish. But I'll tell you this, David, and this is like, you know, we got a lot of Korean friends and Koreans generally, I would say they are more interested by Sichuan food than they are Cantonese food. Yes, they eat a lot of mala. Not, not that my Korean friends don't like Cantonese food, but they... They do feel it differently when they eat Sichuan food. So Sichuan food was able to appeal to the more extreme, strong taste buds. The people who desire to get hit, like, you know, right. in their in their tongue and, and you know, get and, their sensories. And it is true that every culture has different taste buds, right? Yeah. For example, Andrew, <laughs> Cantonese food is really popular in Japan. Yeah. Like, you can get, uh, you can find, like, dim sum restaurants actually all yeah, over Japan. Yeah, not a lot of Sichuan restaurants in Japan probably, right? But I could tell you this, a lot of like, like white people who have traveled and are kind of adventurous white people, they really like Sichuan food. Probably like to do drugs. They like mala. They do. They do. And they're like, oh, oh my gosh, I love sweating. Oh, my face is dummy, dude. <laughs> that's, what they, that's what they tell me. They literally said that. It hits different. Sichuan food hits different. It does. Especially it does. the modern style with the 70% but mala. I can't eat it every day. Are you kidding me? With that much oil and that much... Like peppers, I just can't do it all the time. Right. But it is great, and I'm glad that Sichuan food got popular. And now, every Chinese restaurant that opens up probably serves some chili dish. Yeah, and that's Honestly. why you can use smala every day. And I'm not just saying that to promote smala. You could use but, any chili crisp all the time, the ones that are more toned down, because yeah. it gives you that Sichuan hit that you want without covering yeah. the entire this, this dish. This is in really it. good for people who didn't grow up eating mala food. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is really good. So. Uh, so, basically, this is my final takeaway, man. I think there's got to be more representation of everything in China at a okay. more elevated, systemized mm -hmm. level. Much like Guangdong and Sichuan food have all the levels now, you, low, middle, high. You don't see in low, middle, high like Guizhou food mm -hmm. yet. You know, I, I don't. I doubt they even have that in China. However, interestingly enough, Andrew, Jack Ma is starting a new pre-packaged elevated food trend in China and a lot of people are doing this. So, Andrew, you know who was the first people to do it? it was Chen Kung Fu, Kung Fu, the, the people who jacked Bruce Lee's logo. Wow. So basically what they were doing was they were using a centralized kitchen, proprietary ovens or like sort of cooking techniques like steaming and air frying it at the same time or whatever. So basically they were able to create essentially frozen meals that tasted relatively similar to the fresh cooked one. Wow. And I'm saying that every province of Chinese food needs to go through that commercialization and systemization. Do I wish that, you know, there could be chefs that are authentic from every province traveling everywhere all the time? Sure, but that's not the reality, mm. right? In the future, if people want regional provincial representation in China and possibly this system may make, it, make its way to America, Panera Bread's already doing it right now, even though Panera Bread stuff doesn't taste good. Right. I'm saying that in the future of the world, but especially China, hyper-elevated TV dinners is the way to go.
Wow. Because that's the only way to get these really authentic provincial dishes shipped all across everywhere. And nowadays, you know, the reheating technology is becoming so advanced. Because I remember, I used to get gale aulam, this like curry beef in, at Maxim's in Hong Kong. And I was always like, man, this is pretty good. How do they cook in all that stuff in the back? They're not. Yeah, they're preheating it, yeah. It comes in an elevated TV dinner. Yeah, probably comes in a bag. I mean, you know, soup plantation, everybody did it. Anyways, guys, uh, let me know in the comments down below. Um, are you pro Sichuan food or do you feel like it peaked? And does that interest you in small sauce? Andrew, Check it out. Last question. How are you feeling the New Orleans flavored chicken wings? Where does that fall? In Cantonese food or just foreign food? Or, or Sichuan food? That's not Sichuan. Listen, guys. Let me know if you guys know about the New Orleans flavors chicken wings. In China, yeah. I'm not a fan, but, you know, it's popping. Anyway, guys, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Until next time, we the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace.